Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for the opportunity to uh, teach, and I thank you for uh, just those who are interested in hearing your word. I uh, thank you for Michelle and, and the time that she's able to be here. I pray, Father, that you would continue healing in her life as well. And for all of us, God, we need your presence and we need the help that you can provide, especially as we grow older in life. So bless our lesson, I pray in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Our main text is Matthew chapter 24, and I've selected a few verses from that. Here's what I want you to hear. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, therefore if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. Those are the words of Jesus. No one will understand the conflicts in the Middle East without first knowing Shiite end time teaching. One reason for the Islamic uh, Iranian revolution in 1979 was for the unseating of the Shah of Iran. It was pro-West and supportive of the United States and Israel. He was replaced by a true Shiite, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who saw Israel as the little Satan and the United States as the big Satan. He came to power to hasten the destruction of Israel and the elimination of the Jewish people. This is necessary before the Islamic Messiah, known as the Mahdi, meaning the guided one, guided by Allah, can reappear on earth and lead a crusade whereby Islam will rule the world. That's the important sentence you need to understand. See? Israel has to be wiped off the face of the map from the river to the sea before the Islamic and, uh, Messiah can appear, and his name is the Mahdi, meaning the guided one. Okay? Islam's highest ranking military officer, Defense Minister Ahmad Vahadi, said to a news organization one run by Iran's Revolutionary Guards, here's a quote from him, with having the treasure of the holy defense, now notice that's capital, the holy defense, he's talking about Allah there, that's their treasure, that's their defense, and martyrs, those who are willing to die for the cause of Islam. We are ready for the big war. Of course, this confrontation has always continued. However, since we are in the era of the coming, did you see that? Since we are in the era of the coming, this war will be a significant one. Shiites believe near the end of time, great wars will take place, and the Mahdi, the Shiites' 12th Iman, will reappear and kill all the infidels, that's you and me, raising the flag of Islam in all corners of the globe. When Defense Minister Vadi referred to the coming, notice he said, since we are in the era of the coming, he was referring to the coming of the Mahdi. So before we meet the Mahdi, we need to ask the question, who are the Shiites? There are two major sects within Islam. There are actually many, but two major sects. There's the Sunnis and the Shiites. The Sunnis comprise 80% of the Muslim population. Once Muhammad died, Sunnis insisted that his successor be elected since Muhammad never appointed a successor. The Shiites insisted Muhammad's successor come through his bloodline. They are the most dangerous of the two sects, as they have a very literal interpretation of the Quran and maintain their authority as being both political and religious. 
Their desire is to rule the world under Sharia law, which calls for the political, uh, which calls for the political and the religious as well. So they're both political and religious in what they're attempting to do. Their desire is to rule the world under Sharia law, which calls for the killing of all infidels or non-Shiite Muslims. They don't even like the Sunnis. The vast majority of Shiite Muslims live in Iran. Now let's talk about Islam's holy books, the Quran and the Hadith. The Quran is considered the holiest book of Islam, which supposedly contains revelation from Allah, which was given to his prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel. However, Islam's second most sacred book, the Hadith, is a collection of Muhammad's sayings, none of which are attributed to Allah. It contains most of the Shiite end time teachings. So we're not so much looking to the Quran, we're looking at the Hadith for much of what we're going to be teaching today. The Hadith was compiled in the ninth century about 200 years after the death of Muhammad. What's also interesting to note is the Quran. I, I just listened to some lectures by a man by the name of Dr. Joe Smith. He was at Calvary Chapel in Chino Hills. And he's an expert on the Quran. And he is showing us that the Quran, you get all 114 surahs or chapters in the Quran it comes over 200 years after the death of Muhammad. So that is a real problem. And we maybe sometime we'll go into more detail. Here you have the Hadith, which uh, consists of the sayings of Muhammad. Many of these sayings were handed down over generations of time from Muhammad's friends and his 15 wives. So, you have, you have uh, many different copies of the Hadith that are out there. The most authoritative, or the one that is most used today, is the one by al-Bukhari, which we have shown you here. And he's collected, this is back uh, 200 years after, uh, after the death of Muhammad. He's collected uh, uh, some 600,000 sayings of Muhammad, and then has whittled them down to comprise what's known as the Hadith. So Muhammad, before Islam was a religion, studied both Christianity, Judaism, and Zoroasterism. His concepts of the end times came primarily from these three sources, orally, from Arab Christians, from Jewish rabbis and followers of Zoroasterism, that's a Persian religion. Muhammad created an occultic individual known as the Mahdi, whom he saw as the Islamic Messiah. So, this is what we want to talk about now. You're going to find this absolutely unbelievable. Who is the Mahdi? The Shiites see the Mahdi as a real flesh and blood person who was born in Samarra, Iraq, in 868 A.D. His name was Muhammad Abri son Abu Ali. He was a descendant of the prophet Muhammad. Sometime between the age of four and six he vanished. Subsequently he became invisible. <laughs> he has been called the hidden Iman. An Iman is a teacher of Islam who does not receive revelation directly from Allah. The prophets do, but not uh, an Iman. He's simply proclaims the message that the prophets have received. So the Mahdi is considered an exception to this, however, as he is thought to be greater than all the prophets, including Jesus. Now this is the Islamic Jesus, and we're going to show you a real distinction between the Muslim Jesus and the biblical Jesus, but that's coming up. Anyway, Jesus said, uh, in their way of teaching is a recognized prophet of Islam. However, the Mahdi is not greater than Muhammad. He was the last and greatest of all the prophets. 
The Mahdi is presently, get this out, he's presently in a state of occultation, which means he's in a state of stupor. <laughs> Surviving to this day, though mysteriously given. That would make him, in the year 2024, 1,156 years old, as well as still living, though unseen. Once Iran, through her proxies, or by directly destroying the nation of Israel, the Mahdi will come out of his occultic state of hiding and reveal himself to the world. Now you want us to understand why these wars are existing in the Middle East between the Muslims and the nation of Israel. Why they want to drive them out from the river to the sea. And most of the people who are pro-Palestinian, all these demonstrations, if you ask them what river they're talking about, they can't tell you, the Nile. No, it's the Jordan. If you ask them what the sea is, oh, the Atlantic Ocean. No, uh, it's the Mediterranean. I mean, that's the kind of education you get in universities today. But anyway, the point uh, being is that Israel has to be destroyed, has to be totally off their land. Then this Mahdi, who's been in this state of occultation, this stupor, for 1,156 years, will finally wake up. <laughs> so the Mahdi is a messianic figure. To Christians, an anti-type figure. I'm not saying he's the antichrist. I'm saying he's a type of antichrist. He is the Islamic savior who is both sinless and infallible. But as we will later see, he is not immortal. Once he is unveiled, he will be guided to a mountain in Syria where he will recover the true Jewish Torah and then to the Sea of Galilee where he will find the true hidden Gospels. Those are Gnostic Gospels. So when we talk about the Jewish Torah, we're talking about the first five books of the Old Testament, the writings of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's going to find the true writings of Moses. See? And he's going to find the hidden Gospels. These are Gnostic Gospels. Now, what is Gnosticism? Gnosticism was a religion that was in opposition to Christianity. And I, and I guess I can make it very simple. Uh, there's a lot to say about Gnosticism, and we've talked about it extensively in this class, but not in recent months. But here's, here's Gnosticism in a simple form. The spirit is good, the flesh is evil. Okay? Therefore, Jesus could not be God in the flesh. See? Because God is spirit. And spirit, which is good, would never inhabit an evil flesh. Therefore, Jesus is not God manifest in the flesh. That's Gnostic teaching, okay? So it's a denial of the deity of Jesus. So he's going to uh, discover the true Jewish Torah, the writings of Moses. Uh, he finds that in Syria, interestingly. He goes to the Sea of Galilee and he finds all these Gnostic Gospels. Then he will go to Antioch, Assyria, where he will reveal the Ark of the Covenant. So he seems to think the Ark of the Covenant is in Syria. No indication of that. He will use the newly discovered Torah and the newly discovered Gospels to convince both Jews and Christians how wrong they were. Discovering the Ark of the Covenant will be given them, will only give further evidence for the truth of his message. So the Mahdi has come to light. Israel is no longer in their land. And he's gone and made these discoveries. And he's saying, look what I have found. See? Your religion was wrong after all. The motto of the Mahdi will be revenge. He comes to make war. To avenge the blood of all those who persecuted the Shiites. And when the Mahdi reveals himself, Jesus Christ will descend from heaven with 70,000 angels. 
He will return to earth on the wings of angels. The Mahdi will appoint the Islamic Jesus as his deputy, and he will assist the Mahdi in forcing all non-Shiite Muslims to follow the Mahdi or die. He comes to establish, get this, a new world order. What is important to know is the Mahdi represents a type of the biblical Antichrist. However, before he seeks the annihilation of the Jewish people, this is very interesting. Shiites teach he will establish a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews based on Daniel 9, verse 27. Now, you're going to be a surprise at the number of verses that the Shiite Muslims pull out of the Old Testament scriptures to support their argument. We've just started here. If you look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, I don't want to go into it in great detail, but that's the verse that talks about the Arab nations establishing a covenant with the nation of Israel to build a third temple. And then there's going to be a seven-year tribulation period upon the face of the earth. Do you see what the Shiites are teaching in regards to that? That seven-year period that we call tribulation is going to be a seven-year period where the Muslims, the Shiites, are going to be at peace with Israel. It's a form of deception. We want to let you know how much we love you before we destroy you. See? We want to get your confidence first. And once you have confidence in us, woo, we're going we're gonna to blow you up. See? Now, who is the Shiite Jesus? That's the second, uh, next thing I want us to understand. We must first understand that the biblical Jesus and the Islamic Jesus are not the same Jesus. However, Muslims want you to believe they are one and the same. So when they talk about Jesus, they're talking about the Jesus that we worship. But there's a big difference between the two Jesuses. The Quran gives a complete understanding of the Islamic Jesus. Here it is. He was created by Allah from the dust of the earth, just as was Adam. Now when I give you the surah, surah chapter 3, verse 59. The word surah simply means chapter. So, uh, but that in the Quran it's called a surah. So I'm giving you these passages. They come from the Quran. He was conceived by the Virgin Mary, whom the Quran identifies as the sister of Moses and Aaron. And I got the boy. Well, that's a big time period there. Jesus was not born in a manger, but under a palm tree. In the Hadith. Muslims are taught that after a child is born, they are pricked by Satan. That's the very reason why a newborn baby cries. However, both Mary, when she was a baby and born, and Jesus, when he was born, were preserved from Satan's touch. So, when Jesus was born, he never cried, see, because Satan didn't prick him. Muslims do not believe the biblical Jesus was God in the flesh. That's why they like the Gnostic Gospels. For one to believe in the deity of Jesus is to be guilty of track, the blasphemy of Allah of which there is no forgiveness. The Quran says that the God of Islam is the God of Christianity and the God of the Jews. That's what they want you to believe. Here's a surah, chapter 20. Uh, Surah 29, verse 46. Our God and your God is one, and to him we submit. So a Muslim, a, a Shiite Muslim is going to tell you that Yahweh and Allah are just different names for the very same. We worship the same God that you do. No, you don't. So to say there is any other God than Allah... Like if you declare Jesus to be God manifest in the flesh, you're going to be put to death. Therefore, to refer to Jesus as God is to be executed and condemned for all eternity in hell. Jesus was a prophet of Allah. In the uh, Quran, he is called the Word, just as John's Gospel refers to him as the Word. He is also called Messiah. He's also called Christ in the Quran because he was anointed by Allah to communicate his word. Jesus is one of 25 prophets, beginning with Adam and ending with Muhammad. So Adam, the firstborn, uh, he's a prophet of God, of Allah, 
and the last of the prophets is Muhammad. He's favored above his fellow prophets, but second to Muhammad, who is the final revelation of Allah, hence uh, Islam's holy book, the Quran, is attributed to Muhammad. In other words, the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad uh, beginning around 610 up to around 630 AD and, and, and gave revelation to him. Now, Muhammad uh, couldn't read or write, so he had these people, every time he had an epileptic fit, then this was known that he was receiving special revelation from God. And people then were to pick up a bone, a rock, a leaf, anything they could find, and write down what he says right after he had an epileptic fit. And that becomes the Quran as it eventually was put together 200 years after he died. I wonder if those leaves and rocks made it very far. So absurd, it's almost comical. Yeah. yeah. So, get this now. Uh, Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad as the comforter or the helper, as mentioned in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. You know that passage where Jesus said he's going to die, he's going to uh, leave them, he didn't want to leave the apostles as orphans, he said. And so he says, I'm going to send my helper, I'm going to send the comforter, and the Muslims take those words of Jesus from John chapter 14 and say, Ah, I'll tell you who the helper is. It's not the Holy Spirit, it's Muhammad. Jesus prophesied the coming of the prophet Muhammad. Muslims believe that Jesus performed miracles, but did so only with the permission and power of Allah. Some of these so-called miracles mentioned in the Quran come from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. So, uh, these Gnostic Gospels often carry the name of one of the apostles to give them some kind of authenticity, see? So here's Thomas. This is not the Thomas who's the apostle, uh, but they, they attribute it to him. These Gnostics do. So uh, here's Jesus. Uh, he's a child, and so he breathed into clay birds. So he made little birds out of clay, breathed into them, and these Clay birds came to life and they began to fly away. These are some of the first miracles of Jesus according to Muslims. And that's when Jesus was a little child playing with clay. Muslims do not believe that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross. Allah would never allow this to happen to one of his special prophets. When the Jews threatened to turn Jesus over to the Romans and have him put to death as a common criminal, Allah made Judas... Remember who Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples, to take on the appearance of Jesus. And he was crucified in Jesus' place. So in the meantime, Allah rescued Jesus by putting him into a deep sleep and then transported him into heaven. The big deceit for the Christian is that Jesus did not die for our sins. Rather, Judas, an Islamic made imposter, was crucified in the place of Jesus. <clears throat> Muslims likewise believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. However, this is important, I want, this gets a little detailed now, so I really want you to understand. However, he, and I'm, I'm always putting, you'll notice I don't capitalize he when I'm referring to the Islamic Jesus. When I'm referring to the real Jesus, I'll capitalize, but I'm not going to Capitalize the Islamic Jesus. Okay. However, he, that is the Islamic Jesus, cannot come until the Mahdi comes out of his occultic stupor and reveals himself to the Shiites. So, Islam has been destroyed. I mean, Israel has been destroyed, removed from their land. Now the Mahdi comes out of his stupor and he reveals himself. It is then that Christ will descend from heaven with 70,000 angels where his feet, now get this, will stand on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. That comes right out of Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. That's the very thing we believe. When Christ comes back again a second time, where does his feet land? On the Mount of Olives. The Shiites say the same thing. The Mahdi will appoint him as his deputy, and Jesus will pledge his loyalty to the Mahdi, 
Some of Jesus' first words upon his second arrival on earth will be, Oh, Muslim people, the truth has arrived, and the falsehood of Christianity has passed away. So when Jesus comes back again, what's he going to say? The falsehood of Christianity has passed away. Once the Mahdi, who has always been on earth, makes war against all infidels, that is when Jesus will come from heaven to the Mount of Olives, and then he heads to Iraq, where he will help the Mahdi defeat the armies gathered against Islam. What we're saying here, kind of a little recap, but when the Mahdi comes out of his occult state, we're going to show you that the Antichrist is ruling the world at this time. And we'll talk about him. He's known as the Dajjal, D-A-J-J-A-L, the Dajjal. But anyway, you have the Antichrist ruling. There are all these infidels now that are coming to war against the Mahdi and his army. And so now that's when Jesus comes back again. Uh, with all these angels, and he comes back on the wings of angels to help the Mahdi defeat all these infidels that are making war against him. And that will happen in Iraq. Then he turns his attention to destroy the Antichrist who has been ruling the world, like we said. The Hadith refers to the Antichrist as the Jal. At the time that Jesus appears on earth, the Antichrist is located in a minaret in Damascus, Syria. So Jesus and his angelic army heads from Iraq, where he has just helped the Mahdi gain victory, to confront the Antichrist, who will then flee from Damascus to the land of Israel, where he will be killed by Jesus at the gate of Lud, which is located near the Tel Aviv airport. So when Jesus comes back, he comes back, lands his feet on the Mount of Olives, goes to Iraq, helps the Mahdi uh, conquer the, the apostate army. He hears where the Antichrist is. So he's in Damascus, Syria. So now Jesus travels from Iraq to Damascus, Syria. That chases the Antichrist to the gate of blood outside of the Tel Aviv airport where Jesus slays him. So once the Antichrist is defeated, Jesus Christ will uh, eradicate, get this now, he will eradicate all Jewish people still alive. You talk about anti-Semitism? His job, his job is to get rid of every Jew. He will tell all Christians that they have must understood his man. Once all the Jews are, are dead, now he's going to talk to the Christians. And you've, you've misunderstood my message all along. That uh, he's going to say, I'm not the savior of mankind. Rather, he will tell Christians to convert to Islam, for it is the only true religion. He will shatter all crosses and destroy all churches. It is at a time that Shiite Muslims believe Islam will rule the world under the leadership and authority of the Mahdi. His reign will be anywhere from 17 to 309 years. Well, that's a big span there. But remember, there are many different copies of the Hadith. And so each of the Hadiths have a different time when the Mahdi, how long he'll rule over the world. But um, most would say 19 years and a few months. So the Antichrist um, is, uh, or I should say the Mahdi. Now the Antichrist is dead. The Mahdi is now ruling the world, we'll say, for 19 years. The Mahdi's life will end tragically. This is humorous. The Mahdi's life will end tragically when a woman by the name of Sadia from the tribe of Timon kills him by hurling a pig trough from the roof of her house while he is passing by. Imagine the Mahdi has been in occultation for 1,156 years before he wakes up. 
that dies at the hands of a woman who hits him on the head with a pig truck. <laughs> and of course, uh, the pigs, you know, that doesn't go too well uh, it, with the Jews. And, and uh, so you got... The Islamic Jesus, too, will die once he returns to earth a second time. He will leave a total of 41 years. So when Christ comes back to earth a second time, He's going to live 41 years. 22 years after his return, he will marry, and he's going to beget children. 19 years later, he will die and be buried next to Muhammad, where he will be until the day of resurrection. So that is the Islamic Jesus. Now, who is the Shiite Antichrist? We've already talked about him the the, uh, the jaw, so to speak. He will be a Jew, born in Iran, to parents who have been childless for 30 years. Now, I, I follow this because you'll find this interesting if you know the, the Antichrist, what the Bible says about him. He will have only one eye. Remember what Zechariah says? Chapter 11, verse 17, the Antichrist will have one eye. He will call himself a prophet and travel by riding on a mule. He will claim to be Jesus, the Son of God. He will claim to be a deity and perform false miracles. You see this of the Antichrist in Daniel 8. He has a militaristic mentality. Daniel also says uh, the real Antichrist. He will go forth with an army of 70,000 Jews and 70,000 Tartans, and he will conquer the world except for two cities, Mecca and Medina, both in Saudi Arabia. He will rule the world for 40 days, during which time a day will be like a year. I can imagine so, if you know, the Antichrist is ruling. But only 40 days, but it will seem like a forever. He will have the word infidel written on his forehead. This is the Antichrist. He will, uh, his reign will be characterized by cruelty and deceit. So Daniel says of the real Antichrist. His purpose is to be deified, worshipped, and to reign over the whole earth. And we read that in Revelation 13. He will meet his defeat and death at the hands of the Islamic Jesus and his angelic army in Israel. So now you know something about the Shiite Antichrist. It's also interesting to note that there's the invasion of Gog and Magog mentioned in the Hadith. This as it's mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. So once the Antichrist is killed and all Jewish people are destroyed, two unidentified nations referred to as Gog and Magog will invade the land of Palestine or Israel. But now you see uh, the Jews are all out of the land. They're all dead. They're, there is no Israel any longer. So the land now becomes known as Palestine. According to the Hadith, their army is so large. Uh, this is fun. Their army is so large, this army from Gog and Magog, wherever it is, that when the soldiers drink from the Sea of Galilee, there is no water left. They, they, they lap up the whole sea. They will besiege the Islamic Jesus and his companions. Jesus will cry out to Allah to save them, and Allah will respond by sending deadly locusts Similar to what we read in Revelation chapter 19, uh, chapter 9 rather, where during the great tribulation period, this is Revelation 9, during the uh, tribulation period, an angel was given a key to open a bottomless pit. Smoke arose from the pit like the smoke of a great furnace that darkened the sun. From out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and they were given power to torment all of those who worship the Antichrist. This is the biblical understanding. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. As I said, this is the biblical account of the swarming locusts from Revelation chapter 9, the first 12 verses. It has nothing to do with Gog and Magog, but it does as far as the Shiites are concerned. The Shiite account has the armies of Gog and Magog destroyed by these deadly insects. Following the defeat of Gog and Magog, 
Jesus will proclaim Islam as the true religion and call for all Christians to convert to Islam. All crosses will be broken. All pigs will be exterminated. Imagine the Antichrist uh, the pig drop, you know, when it happened before. Anyway, Jesus will then make regular pilgrimages to Mecca. During the 40 plus years that Jesus is alive, he will assist the Mahdi in setting up the kingdom of God on earth. The Mahdi will usher in an era of peace as implements of war are converted into agricultural use. You, you see this in Isaiah chapter 2 when we talk about the millennium. All false religions will be eradicated by Islam. The earth will flourish and beastly animals will be domesticated. And you can see this in Isaiah 35. And no believer in Allah will ever get sick. So the Mahdi now is setting up his kingdom, much like Jesus would set up the millennial kingdom that we've talked about so many times here. So once Jesus dies now, doesn't tell us how he's going to die, but he dies peacefully and gracefully, as well as all believers die. That's, that's all the Shiite people now who have come to follow the true Jesus here. I mean, they're, they're Islamic Jesus. So once Jesus dies, all believers will die peacefully and gracefully, where they will await the day of resurrection. So the deaths of the believers are like a type of rapture, you might say, to spare them from the horrible things yet to come. What we have and will yet describe is a type of biblical Islamic millennium, like the Garden of Eden before the fall. I'll, I'll help you with this. In Islam, this is followed by a type of biblical tribulation. The Bible speaks of a seven-year tribulation following the rapture of the church and then a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth with the church on earth. Islam has a 40-year millennium, so to speak. I mean, that's kind of a strange play on words there, but they have a 40-year period that is equivalent somewhat to the biblical millennium. And then the biblical millennium is followed by the Great Tribulation, which is an indefinite period of time, and which will lead to the day of resurrection and the day of judgment. So, here's what I want you to see. Follow me now. Here's what we teach in this class. There's the rapture of the church. There's the tribulation period following the rapture. Seven years, right? Christ comes back to earth with the church at the end of the Great Tribulation of seven years. Then you have a thousand year reign of Christ on earth. That's what we teach in this class. Islam says there's once the Messiah comes, uh, their Messiah, their Jesus comes, once, once the Mahdi sets up his kingdom, it will last for 40 years. But it's equivalent to the Christian millennium of a thousand years. With me? So the millennium, their millennium, their 40 years comes before the tribulation. We have it just the other way around. The tribulation and the millennium, they have the 40 year millennium and then an indefinite period for the tribulation. But before the great tribulation comes, all believers die. That's not unbelievers, all believers die, including Jesus. And they die to await the day of resurrection. We're going to go probably a little long with this, but hopefully you find it interesting. Notice now the appearance of the good beast during the tribulation. After Jesus and all the righteous in Allah die, a good beast appears on earth. Since all that is left are unbelief, this is what's going to be happening during their tribulation period. Since all that is left are unbelievers, the beast will call the world to acknowledge all. The beast will wear the ring of Solomon and carry the rod of Moses. Those who reject his message will have the word infidel written on their foreheads. Hmm, Revelation talks about that. What ultimately happens to the beast is unknown. So this beast is actually in Islam's favor. He's kind of like a prophet during their time of tribulation, 
to all the unbelievers because it's the only unbelievers that are now living. Once the beast is revealed, a cloud of smoke will suddenly appear and engulf the world, causing great suffering. Then there will be three great landslides in three different parts of the earth, in the east, in the west, and in Arabia. This will be followed by a reversal of the earth and the sun, rising from the west rather than from the east. Boy, that's going to be a head spinner. <laughs> the final catastrophe before the hour or the day of resurrection. Those phrases mean the same thing. When a Muslim talks about the hour, he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, okay? So, before the hour or the day of resurrection, there's going to be a great fire that will break out south of Edom in the territory of Yemen. Boy, Yemen is in the news a lot today, right? It will spread worldwide, this fire is going to start in Yemen. It will spread worldwide, and it will be so intense that it will drive the entire human race to Syria. The place of Allah's final assembly and judgment. So, is this, we're now in the, in, the, in the Islamic tribulation period, right? All believers are dead. There's this beast that comes. This beast is proclaiming a message. You better get right with all. And then, but there's going to be tremendous uh, uh, smoke and, and uh, different problems that are taking place. And this fire is going to come out of Yemen that will spread to the whole world, forcing everybody to flee to Syria. So the, uh, Allah, Allah wants everybody in Syria because that's where the final judgment is going to take place. Now, notice the assembling of the people in Syria for permanent judgment. First thing you need to note are the three trumpets. The three trumpets. After the worldwide gathering of people in Syria, the first of three trumpets will be blown. The first trumpet is called the trumpet of terror. It is a wake-up call to strike terror in the hearts of the people. The second trumpet is called the trumpet of swoon. It will result in every living thing in heaven and earth dying, except for Allah and those he desires to spare. Even angels will die. So this is a time when all are, everybody's a non-believer. Maybe they got converted somehow through the message of the beast or whatever. But now most everybody is going to die with the sound of the second trumpet, even angels. Once the universe is nearly void of life, hardly anybody living now, Allah will declare his sovereignty. Three times he will shout, I am the mighty one. Then three times he will shout, to whom does the kingdom belong today? With no one answers because most everybody's dead. He then says, it belongs to the one God, the conqueror. In the time period between the second and third trumpet, Allah creates a new heaven and a new earth. So there's going to be a, quite a revolution taking place between the blowing of these two trumpets. The third trumpet is called the trumpet of resurrection. Now notice the intermediate state of all the dead. Muslims believe in the immortality of the soul. That is to say they believe in life after death like we do. Once one dies, they go to an intermediate state that is said to be between death and resurrection. I don't know what that means. Death is that annihilation versus resurrection, life, whatever. Uh, anyway, there's an intermediate state. You die, you go to this intermediate state. It exists between death and resurrection. There they will be visited by two angels, one named Munkar and the other named Nakir. These angels question the person who died and excess his deeds. So his, his spirit is in the ground somewhere in this intermediate state, and each one is now going to be questioned by these angels. They make a preliminary determination as to one's ultimate fate. If it is paradise, notice now, the grave is loosened for relaxation, and the, purpose is in, uh, and the person now that died is in a state of bliss until the day of resurrection. So his spirit, you see, went to under the ground somewhere, 
and, I, and, and uh, now that ground is being loosened up to giving a little bit of freedom if he's going to go to paradise. That's determined by one of these angels. If the angel decides the person deserves hell, the grave will be tightened and the person will remain in a state of torture until the day of resurrection. So the ground is going to be tightened around that person's soul. This intermediate state is something like what Jesus referred to as Hades in the Old Testament times. We've talked about that. It was divided into paradise or Abraham's bosom and torments. Uh, or, uh, it was another section with a great gulf separating the two divisions of Hades. And remember how in the Old Testament times you couldn't go directly to heaven when you died. Why? Because Christ did not shed his blood for man's sin. So you went to this intermediate state, either paradise or torments. And it was after the resurrection of Christ that paradise was free. So there's an intermediate state uh, for the for all those Muslims who died or all those people who died. Um, and it's uh, to await the resurrection. Notice now the hour or the day of resurrections. Those deemed worthy of heaven by the two angels that... Uh, interviewed all those spirits underground, are raised from the dead first. Before this occurs, Allah will cause the dead to start growing underground. Their, 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 their bodies are going to start growing underground to get ready to receive their spirit, which is underground. So the, the body is coming together under the earth. Allah will order the blowing of the third trumpet. The spirits of the dead will enter their bodies now, which will then come out of the grave. So the bodies are growing underground. Now you have the uh, trumpet sounding again, and the spirits enter the body. The saved and the unsaved are raised in one resurrection. They all come out of the ground. Muhammad will be the first to be resurrected. All who are raised will be naked, barefooted, and all men will be uncircumcised. A sign of Jewish hatred. Remember that the, the mark of circumcision began with Abraham and was uh, the mark of the Jew, separating the Jew from the pagan. But in the resurrection, that all us men, we will be uncircumcised. Abraham will be the first to be clothed and he will be seated at the right hand of Allah. You need to understand that they would, they believe that Allah was really uh, and Muslim even before Islam came into existence. Notice now the day of reckoning. There will be an interval after the resurrection and before the final judgment. There's going to be a period of time here. Before the there's the resurrection, then there's the, the final judgment. There's a period of time here. It will be a time of unbearable toil and agony, both physically and psychologically. Great fear will grip the people. No one is exempt except Muhammad and those devout Muslims like Jesus and some of the prophets whom Allah has chosen to spare. For all believers in Allah, this interval becomes a type of purgatory. Notice they're getting the Catholic teaching of purgatory. So they've come out of the grave. There, there's, there's, uh, the judgment has not yet taken place, but they're going to suffer a type of purgatory. It's a form of purification before they can enter paradise. Understand? Everybody with me? Okay. Woo! <laughs> now let's talk about the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, Allah descends from heaven to judge humanity and the genus who were genies created from smoke. That comes out as Zoroasterism. These supernatural spirits are prominent in the Islamic literature. These genies are condemned because they heard the message about Allah and rejected it because they were allured by the pleasures of the world. So there are these creatures created out of smoke there, and we, you know, when a genius comes out of a bottle, well, anyway. People will be judged based on their reception of Muhammad's message as well as their ethical conduct. Allah will validate the preliminary judgment at the grave of the deceased by weighing the good and bad deeds of, its, of each person on the scale. So these angels, remember, have already evaluated them. But now when they come out of the grave, 
Allah is going to evaluate every single person. And he has what's called the scale by which, hey, the good deeds or the bad deeds, which which ways the most here. People will be judged uh, based on their reception of Muhammad's message as well as their ethical conduct, as we said, on the scale. Now, notice the crossing of the bridge. Following judgment, so they've all been judged at the scale by Allah. So following judgment, every person will cross a bridge that spans the gulf of a fiery hell. Muhammad will be the first to cross into paradise. That's on the other side of this bridge. Remember, there's a new heaven and a new earth now, so things are quite different than what we have today. Those whom Allah has condemned to hell will fall off the bridge right into the pit of hell. The faithful will make it across the bridge, but will do so with fear and trembling, knowing that Allah is a capricious God who can change his mind at any time. So you can imagine, man, I don't know, you know, it's God, is Allah going to change? I don't know, am I going to fall off the bridge or not? Then you have the gathering at the pool. So these are now the ones that have got across the bridge and didn't fall into hell. On the other side, the faithful will gather at the pool of the prophet. There they will drink for the day of reckoning and the crossing of the bridge cause such agony and stress, as you can imagine that they have an intense thirst that will finally be quenched. So they have this pool they can drink from. Then you have the intercessions. At the pool, Muhammad will begin to intercede with Allah to allow the faithful to enter paradise. A second intercession will take place as the angels, prophets, martyrs, and the faithful intercede for those who fell off the bridge and landed in hell. They will all ask Allah if they have an atom of faith Allah. If they have an atom of faith in their hearts, will you deliver them? Allah will then show mercy and dip his hand into hell and bring out a large number of people. Only those who believed in, get this now, more than one God. Polytheists will be eternally assigned to hell. This would include all Christians who believe the doctrine of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as the one God manifested in three persons. While we see the Trinity as one God, Islam teaches we believe in three gods. We are polytheists. That is called in Islam shrak and is an unforgivable crime worthy only of hell. It is of interest to note that Islam's Trinity is Father, Son, and the Virgin Mary. The comforter or helper, remember we talked about this, as promised by Jesus, we know to be the Holy Spirit, but Muslims refer to that comforter as Muhammad. So, the Trinity then is the Father, Son, and Virgin Mary, not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then you have Islam's paradise. Paradise is an eternal state for all believing Muslims. It is divided into several parts. Heaven is for Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Then there is a second level called virgin silver. This is Adam's residence. He's the first of the prophets. The third level is pure gold and is residence of Jesus and John the Baptist. The fourth level is called pearls and it belongs to Joseph. The fifth level is called white gold and is reserved for Enoch. Interesting Old Testament prophet there. The sixth level is silver, and it belongs to Aaron and Abraham. The rest of humanity live in the garden, which is a perfect environment where all desires are fulfilled. It has lavished accommodations and spacious mansions. There will be never-ending feasts, all you can eat, perpetual virgins, who never grow old, and who never lose their virginity. Every male Muslim gets 40 virgins for his sexual enjoyment. Every martyred Muslim who died during and uh, during uh, by killing an infidel, you have to kill an infidel, uh, I mean, uh, you died killing an infidel, trying to kill an infidel, you get 72 virgins. 
no matter how many times a woman has sex, she remains young and she remains a virgin. <laughs> Boy, we okay. guys like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now notice Islam's hell. What's this like? In Islamic teaching, hell has seven levels. There's a purgatorial area that some Muslims pass through that is temporary. We talked a little bit about that. Second, there's a level just for all Christians. Thirdly, there's a level for Jews. There's a level for people called Sabaeans an ancient people from South Arabia that rejected Muhammad. There's a level for the people who followed Zoroaster, who died in 552 BC, who was the founder of uh, the ancient Persian religions. There's a level for all idolaters. There's the lowest level is for hypocrites. The punishment in hell will be done by demons. The torture is eternal. The majority of people who go to hell are women. Oh, I'll let you women think about that. This is so because one of the signs of the coming Mahdi is that women will outnumber men 50 to 1. Let's wrap this up now. Let's talk about the 28. 23, 2024 Islamic Hamas war and this cry from the river to the sea. Let's bring this right up to today. <clears throat> we have seen over and over again pro-Palestinian rallies calling for Israel's destruction and, a re, uh, and the total removal from her God-given land by that phrase from the river to the sea. The Arabs and Hamas do not want a portion of Israel for their homeland. They want all of the land. The Arabs have had, yeah, I think if you put this right in your notes, I think it's 87 years of intolerance. I, well, what, I, what I am going to share with you, it must have been a couple of years old when I got it and I realized, hey, the, the math here might not be right. So I think it's 87 years. The Arabs have had 87 years of intolerance, rejection, and missed opportunities. Let me give you 12 examples. We're going to go back to 1937, before Israel ever became a nation. There was the Peel Commission to try to solve the land problem. In 1947, there was the UN partition vote. In 1967, there was the Khartoum Summit. In 1991, there was the Madrid Conference. In 2000, there was the Camp David Summit. In 2001, there was the Terex Summit. In 2007, there was the Anas, the An the Annapolis Conference. In 2008, there was the Realignment Plan. In 2010 and 2013, there was the Joint Peace Talks. In 2019, there was the Bahrain Workshop. In 2020, there was the Trump Peace Plan. Now, I'm asking a question. What do all of these years have in common? Two things. What? The years Israel accepted a peace treaty with the Arab neighbors and offered them painful concessions for peace. The years the Arabs rejected a peace treaty with Israel because they don't want peace with Israel. They want Israel, which they call Palestine. There's no better example of this than the 2000 Camp David Summit when President Bill Clinton, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, and Palestinian Authority Chairman Yasser Arafat of Egypt met. The proposals included the establishment of a demilitarized Palestinian state on some 92% of the West Bank. You know, I hope you, I should have brought a map. You, I, I want you to know, you know where the West Bank is. You need to not look it up when you get home. 92% of the West Bank was offered there. 100% of the Gaza Strip. Uh, was offered them with some territorial compensations for the Palestinians from the pre-1967 Israeli territory. There would be the establishment of the Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. Some Arab neighborhoods would become sovereign Palestinian territory and, other would, and others would enjoy uh, functional autonomy. 
they would be given custodianship, though not sovereignty, over the Temple Mount. Palestinians were offered their own sovereign nation with its own capital. They were given everything and more than they were uh, initially asking. And Arafat, to all of this, said no. Clinton was furious and banged his hand on the table. You are leading your people and the region to catastrophe, he said. Arafat did not want a portion of the land. He wanted all of it from the river to the sea. Remember that? Yes. Many believe the solution for peace in the Middle East, and particularly between Israel and the Palestinians, is to have a two-state solution, Jews and Arabs living side by side. Every president, beginning with Bill Clinton, has called for Israel to give up land for peace. In 1999, Bill Clinton and the Oslo Accord. In 2002, George W. Bush had his uh, roadmap for peace. In 2011, Barack Obama called for Israel to return to its pre-1967 borders. Donald Trump had his deal of the century. Joe Biden has called for a two-state solution, though no plan has been developed. Anthony Blinken, <coughs> Secretary of State under Biden, has said, the only hope for peace is that both sides agree to a two-state solution with Israel giving up territory to create the state of Palestine. I, I just saw this week from Amir Sabarti a quote from one of the leaders of Hamas. And, I, and I, I brought my phone, and I have it on my phone, but it probably take me five minutes to find it. <coughs> so I'll just give you a brief. The, the head of Hamas said, we will not settle for a two-state solution, period. Yeah. Yeah. We will not. We want the whole land. And what is Biden pushing for and Blinken pushing for? Yeah, a two-state solution. The, pro the prophet Joel speaks of God's judgment on the nations that have not only scattered the Jews among the nations, but they've also divided my land. So Joel, the, the, talking about, hey, you better not, you better, you better not be a people who's going to call for the division of, of the land. God has brought his judgments on nations that call for the dividing of Israel. I should have brought this book with me. I, I was going to. In 2008, William Queen, a White House correspondent, wrote the book Eye to Eye, Facing the Consequence of Dividing Israel. The book has a very prophetic cover showing President George W. Bush looking over his right shoulder, eye to eye, with a menacing <laughs> In the eye of the hurricane is the symbol of Israel, the Star of David. Koine gives us 57 catastrophic natural disasters that hit the United States from 1991 to 2005, and each disaster immediately followed one of our presidents calling for Israel to give up land for peace. Let me give you an example or two. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know. I had so many to select. I read this whole book. I've actually taught this, but it was when I was at Mariners. Consider the Cap David Summit in July of 2000 when Bill Clinton brought Israel's Prime Minister Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat together to negotiate land for peace. Clinton put pressure on Barak to trade away the heartland of Israel and give Arafat one half of Jerusalem. The day the conference began, <clears throat> fires break out in the western United States. Fifty fires consumed 500,000 acres of land before the end <coughs> of the month. George W. Bush's response after 9-11 was to have the White House to celebrate Ramadan. As part of that celebration in November of 2002, Bush made an incredible statement. We have come together to honor Allah, the God of Abraham. The very next day, a swarm of 88 tornadoes hit the United States. This was followed by President Bush calling for the roadmap to peace. This peace plan was put together by an ungodly quartet, Russia, the United Nations, the European Union, and the United States. The plan's purpose was for Israel to give away its heartland. It was delivered by Daniel Kurtzer, 
the ambassador to Ariel Sharon, Israel's prime minister, on May the 4th, 2003. The next day, Colin Powell went to the Middle East to implement the plan. The first thing he did was meet with the terrorist leader, uh, Nafaz Assad of Syria, who is now deceased, he was the president. As soon as that meeting was over, Powell called a press conference and announced he has promised President Assad that the Golan Heights, you know where that is, the northern oh, yes. part of it, the Golan Heights would be promised in the roadmap. So the, so the Golan Heights was going to go to Syria. Powell was going to force Israel to give up the Golan Heights. The very next day, the greatest tornado swarm in the history of the United States occurred. 412 tornadoes broke out. The previous high was 177. You might say all of this is a coincidence. But Koenig documents 57 times a catastrophe of one form or another struck the United States the day after one of our presidents called for Israel to give up land for peace, including 9-11, by the way. You might want to uh, get that book. You have it there in the, your notes, and you might find it interesting. While these disasters are not the total fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, they are certainly remedial warnings from God. You don't mess with Israel by forcing her to give up her God-given land to her enemy for a peace that will not last. Joel's prophecy speaks of the time when the Messiah comes to establish his millennial kingdom. One of the first things he will do is call for the nations of the world to the valley of Jehoshaphat outside of Jerusalem and judge them based on how they treated the Jews during the Great Tribulation. Did they persecute and scatter the Jews? Did they divide up my land? This is what Jesus is talking about in his parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25, when the Son of Man will judge the nations. Those who cared for the Jewish people during their time of tribulation are the sheep and will enter the millennium. Just because you enter the millennium does not mean you're saved, so you understand that. The goats are those nations who did not help the Jews. And Jesus will say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did, did not do it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it not to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In this lesson, we have seen some similarities between biblical eschatology and Islamic eschatology. The Islamic Messiah is Mahdi. The biblical teaching, in biblical teaching, the Mahdi represents a type of Antichrist. The Islamic Jesus is a great prophet who came to reveal the true Messiah. The Mahdi, and that's the, uh, the, let me say that again. The Islamic Jesus is a great prophet who came to reveal the true Messiah, that is the Mahdi, as he's the their Messiah, and to announce to all Christians that he is not who Christianity taught him to be. In biblical teaching, the Jesus of Islam is a type of the false prophet. The Islamic Antichrist, the Jal, is a type of the biblical Jesus. The biblical teaching. In biblical teaching, the Antichrist is Satan incarnate. The Israeli-Hamas war is not just over different ideologies, not just over a land grab. It is much deeper than that. To the Shiite Muslims, it is a religious war. It is to show the superiority of Allah over Yahweh, the God of Israel and the God of the Christian. It is to drive every Jew out of the Holy Land establish a Palestinian state in Israel so that their Messiah, the Mahdi, can come to earth and deputize the Islamic Jesus to defeat the, the Jal or their Antichrist. And their Jesus will denounce Christianity as false religion so that Mahdi can establish a worldwide caliphate where Shiite Muslims rule the world. That is the real story behind every Arab-Israeli war. Thank <laughs> you.